Hello to all of you online and welcome to our Policies, Institutions and Markets webinar today. My name is Frank Place. I'm the director of the CGIR Research Program on Policies, Institutions and Markets. And we welcome you to this very exciting talk today on climate resilience and job prospects for young people in agriculture. So let me first introduce our speakers today. Um, first, we have Dr. Karen Brooks, who's an adjunct professor of global human development at Georgetown University. Prior to that, as many of you may know, she served as director of the PIM program, where I, which, which I now lead here, um, led by IFPRI. And she did that from July 2012 to August 2018. And she set the bar for leadership of the program very high. And I'm struggling to try to keep up with that at the moment. <laughs> um, prior to that, she worked um, for many years at the World Bank, uh, working on agricultural programs uh, with emphasis on Africa, south of the Sahara, and on the agricultural transformation from central planning to, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. She has also taught in the Department of Applied Economics at the University of Minnesota. She has uh, published on many issues, uh, some of which are agriculture policy and centrally planned economies, price and land policy in countries transitioning from planned to market economies, and the challenges of youth employment in Africa south of the Sahara. She has a PhD from the in economics from the University of Chicago. The second uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Keith Weeby. Uh, he's a senior research fellow at IFPRI, where he leads a research program on global futures and strategic foresight. He also leads that same cluster of work within the policies, institutions, and markets program. Prior to joining IFPRI in October 2013, he was deputy director of the Agricultural Development Economics Division of the UN's FAO in Rome, where he managed a program of economic research and policy analysis for food security and sustainable development and help coordinate preparation of FAO's annual flagship reports on the state of food and agriculture and the state of food insecurity in the world. Previously, he was deputy director of the Resource and Rural Economics Division of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Economic Research Service based in Washington. He, his areas of particular interest, uh, aside from foresight, include land tenure, natural resource use and conservation, agriculture productivity and food security. And Keith holds a PhD in agricultural economics from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. So now before I hand it over to our two speakers, uh, I would like to explain how we will proceed. Um, our speakers will begin very shortly with a presentation that you will see on your screens. And the presentation will last for about 30 minutes. During the presentation, we invite listeners to send in questions via the chat and question windows that you will see on the right side of your screens. We try to collate the questions and group them uh, in similarity and content, and then pose them to our two speakers. Uh, once we are in the Q&A session, our speakers will address these questions, and you can keep uh, adding questions as we enter the Q&A session as well. We are handling it this way to make the best use of our one hour together. We are recording the webinar and we'll make it available on our website shortly after the live event for those uh, unable to join us now or who would like to see it once again. So with that, let me turn it over to Karen Brooks, who will start off. Okay, thank you very much, Frank. Um, and thanks to everyone who has joined for the discussion. I'm really pleased to be back. Um, I think uh, it's great to interact with my colleagues from the PIM program, both online and in person. Um, but it's also really exciting to have the attention and the um, attendance for this discussion of a really important topic. And you'll see the title as Climate Resilience and Job Prospects for Young People in Agriculture. Now, what we're doing here is recognizing that there's a lot of attention and a lot of, of um, you know, work being done on climate change, very appropriately so and a lot of attention to issues of youth employment. What we're trying to do in this uh, piece of work is to pull these two together to show where they intersect, um, the geography is really important, and how, and how a better understanding of that intersection um, leads us to think differently about policy options and policy issues. So that's our task for today. Now this work started, let me tell you a little bit about the history. Um, it was, um, initiated as part of the background work for EFAD's 2019 World Development Report, which is focused on opportunities for young people. And we were asked to do a background paper on the 
issues in, is climate change relevant for youth employment? And, you know, we sort of tossed that question around for a while and there were mixed views. And then some of us in the room said, wait a second, it's very uh, relevant, it's very important. So let's put some time into showing how. And so the suggestion was fine, let's have you do it. So we had a group largely from IFPRI. Um, it consisted of Channing Arndt, um, I was part of it, Shanila Dunstan um, made a wonderful contribution, Fika Hartley, um, Ricky Robertson, and Keith Wiebe. And so of that group today, you have um, Keith and me uh, with you. Now, let me give you the summary, um, just in case you decide to tune out. Um, this is basically where we're, we're hoping to end up. Youth, jobs, agriculture, and climate change. These things belong together. We t tend to treat them separately, but they belong together, particularly for certain parts of the world. They are both problems and solutions that belong together. And those parts of the world are those that are um, in the early process of structural transformation now. And by structural transformation, we mean the process whereby an economy starts out largely dependent on agriculture and then over time diversifies so that the service sector grows, the manufacturing sector grows, there are more job opportunities available, there are shifts in the composition of the labor force. So that's what we're talking about with structural transformation. Now, a number of parts of the world are relatively well um, along in that process. Um, they're largely urbanized, they have very diversified economies, but there are still parts of the world that are in the relatively early stage of structural transformation and they're still dependent on agriculture. Now in those parts of the world, the agricultural labor force is still rising in many of the countries. And it becomes very important to recognize the conditions under which a, a growing um, agricultural labor force can be absorbed into agriculture in a way that increases welfare, increases income, and um, makes good opportunities, especially for young people. Now, that means that for those countries that are low income and dependent on agriculture, we have to recognize that Agriculture has to be a prominent part of a job strategy for those countries, and that's not the case now. In my discussions with um, colleagues in the field and interacting with um, policy leaders in, in um, many African countries, there still isn't really a recognition of the importance of agriculture, including primary agriculture, um, for job opportunities for young people. Now, for those opportunities to be positive, output has to grow faster than the labor force. That's how you get uh, rising labor productivity. Output has to grow faster than the rising labor force. And that's not going to happen unless there is really good adaptation to climate change. So looking ahead, scrolling one decade, two decades, recognizing where the job opportunities for many rural young people in Africa are going to be, means we have to take into account climate change. And it's possible to do that I quite successfully. I think Keith will take us through some of the options for um, addressing that constructively, but it won't happen automatically. There has to be investment, there have to be policy reforms, there has to be an understanding of that importance, that agriculture is part of the future, it's not part of the past for these young people, and there has to be political commitment to move ahead. And the importance of this issue is such that we have to understand it now. We can't kind of put it off 15 years um, because the planning, the investment, and particularly the investment in technology requires um, advanced thinking. So that's basically the structure of this presentation in a nutshell. Um, and let me take you through it a little bit more slowly um, now, slide by slide. So the question of jobs for young people, um, where are they? Big numbers, where are the, where are the, the young people? If we take the UN data, um, UN world population data, and here you see the different regions of the world aggregated um, in different colored lines, and you can see that um, the sort of orangish and brownish lines are showing us East Asia and South Asia with very large numbers of young people, um, but the, the numbers are declining over time, and they will continue to decline um, over the horizon that we're talking about up to 2050 and beyond. Now these are rural young people, they're not all young people, so um, we've gone into the UN data and um, extracted as best we can the rural component of the, um, the age cohort. So 
when we think about South Asia and East Asia, the numbers are large, but they're declining over time. The economies in general, if we sort of aggregate these big regions, the economies are urbanized or they're urbanizing, they're quite diversified. The dependence on agriculture in East Asia and in South Asia has declined over time. There are still some countries within those aggregated regions that are highly dependent on agriculture, but regionally, um, they're, they've proceeded rather far into the process of structural transformation and diversification. In addition, throughout those two enormous regions, the fundamentals are improving. There's investment in infrastructure, human capital, schooling, health. Um, many of them are also well advanced in the demographic transition, which is why those numbers of young people are declining over time, family sizes falling. In most of these countries, in South Asia and in East Asia, absolute employment in agriculture is falling. That's the size of the labor force in agriculture, it's falling. It's falling, of course, as a share of the labor force. Um, that's what we expect to see. And throughout the process of transformation of an economy, the share of labor and agriculture declines. But only um, in the sort of middle and advanced stages of structural transformation does the actual size, the absolute size of the agricultural labor force start to decline. And we're seeing in much of East Asia and in most of um, South Asia, we're seeing an absolute decline in agricultural employment as people take jobs in the service sector, in manufacturing, and in, in other areas. So as climate change intensifies, young people in East Asia and in South Asia are going to be affected by climate change. Of course, everyone is affected by climate change, but their job prospects are such that they'll be able to look across a, a portfolio or a spectrum of opportunities, some of which will be greatly affected by climate change, and others will be less affected, and they'll be able to make choices. They'll have more choices um, because their economies are more diversified. So now we're going to flip to another slide, but I ask you to keep in mind the, the graph, the, the line that you pull off of this slide, which shows um, Africa south of the Sahara, and that's the gray one. Uh, I think it looks gray. Um, and there you see uh, numbers rising up until around 2045, um, looks like it turns about then. Um, large numbers and rising over the decades um, ahead of us. Um, we could say roughly until 2050, and then you start to see a turnaround of uh, as the demographic transition kicks in and family size uh, falls. So in Africa, south of the Sahara, the numbers of the young people are still large and they're rising and they will rise in the decades ahead. Most of these countries are still highly dependent on agriculture. And in the graphic that we're showing you here, you see a very interesting scatter plot of countries, which shows on the horizontal, the proportion of young people, and here we're defining young people as those in the age range of 15 to 24. The proportion of young people in the overall population projected to 2030. And you can see that anybody over the, any country over the 15% mark has what we would call a young demographic profile, um, a high proportion of young people in, in the um, population mix. And then on the horizontal, on the, on the vertical, you see the, the percentage of GDP in agriculture in 2016, that is currently now. So in here, we're giving you an array that shows where the countries that are young, that is, have a lot of young people in them, are dependent on agriculture and where they're not. We've, we've highlighted the um, countries of Africa south of the Sahara in red there, and the, the blue ones are the non-African countries. So you can pull a number of interesting conclusions if you stare at this graphic long enough. Um, one is you see a cluster of blue countries down in the lower left quadrant which tells us that the countries that have already gone through the demographic transition, that is that have aging populations, have relatively little dependence on agriculture. They've also gone through the structural transformation. They've got a lot of manufacturing services. They've got other things going on. Now, if you switch then over to the upper right quadrant, you see that a lot of those countries um, that are very young and highly dependent on agriculture are in Africa south of the Sahara. And if you go down to the um, lower right quadrant, you do see some African countries down there. 
But again, many of those are going to be resource rich countries. And so even though their economies, their GDP uh, overall may not be um, highly dependent on agriculture, their labor is largely is, is more represented in agriculture than the share of the GDP because you know, the mining sector um, doesn't really employ all that many people. So basically the conclusion that we can pull off of this is that for those countries that are um, on the, the youngest range of the global distribution, that is, that have not yet really gone through the demographic transition, that have high numbers where there's a youth bulge, there's a disproportionate dependence on agriculture relative to other countries in the world. And if we recognize how the process of structural transformation is changing globally, um, if we step back and think about what's happening on, on a global scale, we can see that there is substitution of, of capital for labor. There's a lot of automation in place. Um, there's less growth of labor intensive manufacturing now than was the case during the structural transformation of the uh, late 20th century. So one can conclude that those countries that are highly dependent on agriculture now will diversify out of agriculture, services and manufacturing will increase, but at a slower pace than was the case in the past. So the dependence on agriculture is likely to remain greater in the future than um, was the case when the transitions were taking place in, in prior decades. And that means that agriculture, including on the farm and in the food, agri-food system, is going to be a major employer of young people in these red African countries um, in 2030 and probably up to 2050 as well. And that's not really surprising. We can see another view of what's happening with the um, shares of the labor force and the, the absolute numbers of labor in agriculture. Um, if we look at the right-hand graphic on this slide, we can see, yes, the process of structural transformation is taking place in Africa, south of the Sahara. That shows you the orange bars on the right-hand side. They're declining over time. So that means that agricultural employment as a share of employment is declining. However, that doesn't mean that the numbers of people employed in agriculture is going down. On the contrary, even while the share is declining, the numbers are continuing to rise. And that's what's so important to recognize in a job strategy. And it's not actually atypical for countries going through a process of structural transformation. I've given you um, just a, a view of China here. Um, even while China was well engaged in the process of structural transformation from 1978 on, um, up until 1990, um, the labor force and agriculture in China grew absolutely. And only in 1990 did it turn around so that the absolute numbers started to decline as people got jobs in growing other sectors. And you can see that in many other countries that have gone through the process. So we shouldn't think that what's going on in Africa now is somehow atypical, but we have to understand it and understand its implications for young people and where their jobs are going to be. And we have one more case study here of Ghana. I'm gonna um, slide over that rather quickly. I encourage you to look at it because it's just another example showing that you can have an absolute increase in the labor force um, at the same time that you have a rather dramatic decline in the share of labor employed in agriculture. That's what we see happening in Ghana and in many other African countries. So with that um, understanding of what's happening to the demography, the process of structural transformation, the role of agriculture in um, countries that are that have the youth bulge, that are um, still in the process of demographic transition, what does that mean for employment strategies and for planning and for thinking about jobs for young people? We should sort of step away from the myths. There are a lot of myths out there. Um, young people flee the villages, they're all getting old, there aren't any young people there, nobody wants to farm. Um, you know, let, let's recognize that that may be true for some parts of the world. Um, certainly the rural population is aging in Asia. People are leaving farms, um, but it's not the case in Africa. The agricultural labor force in Africa is young and getting younger as um, large numbers of young people enter. Farming is an attractive option for these young people under conducive circumstances. If productivity growth is adequate to increase output faster than labor is, is growing, then um, farming becomes a good option for many young people. And even if it's not 
a, a great option. It may, for a lot of people, it's the only option they have. So it's important for policymakers to make it a good option. So employment in primary agriculture is going to be important in the years ahead. And it's really important to get on top of the, the investments that will require um, be required in order for labor productivity to grow adequately while um, the increased labor force is, is absorbed in the approximately two or one and a half decades ahead. And delayed adapta adaptation to climate change is um, going to be a real threat to um, that increase in labor productivity and an increase in agricultural um, competitiveness. So that's how the issues of youth employment and agriculture come together. And they're very important in particular parts of the world, especially where agriculture is still a, um, an, a, an important sector and an important employer. So let, I'm going to use this as a transition to hand over to Keith um, to tell us what the impacts of um, climate change are likely to be on, on agriculture. And he'll walk us through what it's going to do to yields, um, what the, the projections are for prices, and the implications for some of the shifts in the geography of production. And you know, as he leads us into the discussion of prices, keep in mind um, this time series of the FAO real price index of, of uh, food commodities. Because here you see a secular decline over time and then a turnaround and a rise. So while we think, a lot of people think that food prices are low now, in fact, they aren't low relative to um, what we've experienced in the, the period um, since 1960. So Keith, over to you. Thanks, Karen. So as Karen said, there's been lots of work done on uh, on climate change, lots of work separately on employment and, and youth prospects in agriculture and so forth, but little that brings them together. I'm going to step back now uh, for a moment and just uh, take a look at the climate side of things. Uh, and modeling impacts of climate change, as you would expect, involves a, a lot of uh, diverse and complex considerations. We draw on a range of tools, including climate models, that uh, offer projections about changes in temperature and precipitation over time. We use those as inputs in crop models that explore how those changes in temperature and precipitation are likely to affect crop yields in different agricultural and ecological environments around the world. And then we use economic models to uh, examine how those changes on the production side interact with each other and also with uh, changes on the demand side as populations change and incomes rise and so forth uh, to see on net what are the impacts for things like crop yields, for harvested area, for agricultural production, for prices, and ultimately for food consumption and, uh, and other variables related to that. So this graph shows some results from work that we're currently doing here at IPRI. On the vertical axis on the left-hand side, what is shown are changes in these indicators in 2050 relative to a case where we assume no climate change. So we're trying to isolate the impacts of climate change on crop yields, for example. And we do that for different um, climate change pathways, ranging from relatively modest to as you go from uh, left to right to more extreme cases. And unfortunately, the pathway that the world is on now is more on the right hand side. So for example, if you look at the yield column and you see yields av uh, losses averaging about 5%, that's relative to what we would expect to see in 2050 in the absence of climate change. It's not relative to yields today. And in fact, in the case of yields, we're projecting on average that they'll increase by about 40 to 50 percent between 2010 and 2050. So what we show here is that yields will continue to grow under climate change, but less rapidly than would have been the case otherwise. You can see also that there's a lot of diversity in the impacts. So the box and whisker plots and the individual dots represent outcomes for different types of crops for different regions and using different crop or different uh, climate models. And there's a lot of diversity. In some cases, uh, there are improvements in yields, but the overall uh, predominant pattern is a decline over time relative to the case without climate change. In contrast, we see prices increasing, and that's not surprising uh, if uh, yields are going down and demand is also increasing at the same time. The difference here, as Karen showed on the previous slide, prices are already starting to turn up and we project they'll 
increase by about 10 to 20 percent in real terms for most commodities by mid-century. And the, the further increases shown on this graph thus amplify those increases by an additional uh, 5 to 10 to 15 percent in many cases. And that'll be uh, important in, in some of the things we talk about next. It's important to note, while we include many factors in these uh, projections about the impacts of climate change, one thing we can't include yet directly are implications for uh, employment pro prospects for young people. So we have to uh, take a look at these results and then compare them uh, as Karen did earlier in another slide to see how they vary for different types of countries in different parts of the world. One way to do that is to look at exposure to climate change. So this graph shows, like the earlier one on the horizontal axis, youth as a percentage of total population for about 150 countries around the world. And on the vertical axis, it shows the number of additional days each year that are characterized by extreme heat. And in this case, this is an index based on high humidity and high temperatures, basically corresponding to levels that make it very unpleasant to work, uh, stressful for livestock, and uh, also with uh, implications for crop yields. These are additional days. So uh, on top of, there are some countries, so for example, Uganda doesn't have that many extreme heat days at present, about 50 per year, according to this index, but is projected to experience about 180 such days by 2050. So a large uh, increase both in absolute and relative terms in terms of the stress that that will have on labor and on productivity in general. So a similar uh, pattern would, would be expected to influence crop yields, but interestingly, uh, because of the upturn that we saw earlier and the, the projection of increased prices as a result of climate change, we see that in fact for most countries, the higher prices more than offset the yield losses associated with climate change. And so across the spectrum, from developed to less developed, from a low share of youth population to a high share of youth population, most countries are expected to actually see an increase in agricultural revenues during this time frame as a result of climate change. The effects of climate change are expected to be more severe after mid-century, so that picture will, would very likely change. But for the next several decades, in any case, uh, we see this pattern where agricultural revenues will increase, and that's part of what drives this uh, continued importance of agriculture as uh, not just a source of food, but as a source of employment. However, that's not without risks. And there are a number of those that I'll just mention briefly here. One is, we talked about the revenue side of things on the previous slide, but not the costs. We aren't currently able to make uh, projections of those costs along with the other things that we're looking at in these climate models. And it may well be that as those costs rise, uh, net returns don't change in the same way that gross returns do. A second consideration is, as agricultural prices rise, you would expect that land val values would also rise. So even while uh, employment prospects in agriculture may increase, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that young people will have access to land and be able to benefit as uh, farmers or landowners in addition to uh, being agricultural laborers. A third consideration is that it may be the case that productivity doesn't continue to rise as rapidly as we've projected in some of the developing countries and therefore that their yield losses under climate change might be greater than we've projected. And related to that, there's the concern about differential rates of adaptation. If we go back briefly to this figure, those countries on the left-hand side with the lower share of youth population are generally more developed countries. And it wouldn't be unrealistic to expect that they have a better potential to more rapidly adapt to climate change in terms of changes in technology or crop choice or management practices than the countries on the right-hand side, which are disproportionately developing and sub-Saharan African countries. And if, in fact, those developed countries were able to respond to the point where they maintained production levels and therefore global prices didn't increase to the extent that we projected, then the poorer countries would suffer from yield losses without the benefit of offsetting price increases. And so, in effect, what you'd see in this graph is that the right-hand side would shift downwards and there would be disproportionate losses in those poorer and younger countries. And finally, <clears throat> as Karen also noted, although prices are projected to turn up, 
the long-term historical trend over the past century, uh, despite occasional price spikes, has been of declining uh, crop prices. And if that uh, triggers a sense of complacency, then there's a risk there too that the, the response that's needed today in order to respond to climate challenges tomorrow may come uh, too little and too late in order to be able to address those challenges. So there are opportunities that already exist and many more that are under development and in the pipeline to address specifically some of the challenges that uh, farmers and livestock producers will face in, in terms of climate change. On the left hand side here, the chart summarizes work that was done recently by several CGIAR centers, namely CIMIT, uh, SIP, ICRASAT, and IFPRI, looking at technologies that are either about to be released or in the pipeline and, and uh, expected to be released over the next decade or so. The red figures that you see here uh, on the left-hand side of the chart generally show the losses in yields that would be expected in climate change, due to climate change in 2050. And again, this is relative to a, a scenario without climate change. Whereas the other colored symbols moving towards the right combine different characteristics, such as drought tolerance, heat tolerance, and increased yields, and show the, the range of uh, extent to which those new technologies have the potential to offset uh, partially or even more than offset uh, the losses that are associated with climate change. But importantly, the continued development and dissemination of those technologies depends on continued investment in agricultural science. And looking on the right, we see yet again a clear pattern um, of countries when we compare those with higher shares of youth in the population to those with uh, smaller shares. And again, on the left-hand side, the dots in blue represent more developed countries, and they have a higher share of spending on agricultural research as a share of agricultural GDP than those countries on the right, which are the developing countries. And on the extreme right, although they're not highlighted here, you would find the sub-Saharan African countries uh, with the lowest intensity and also the lowest levels of expenditures on agricultural investment. And that's a really critical concern in terms of uh, anticipating today the challenges uh, that are going to be faced in the coming decades and need to be able to plan and invest in those changes uh, today so that we're not trying to respond to them in future when it's too late. Back to you, Karen. Okay, uh, thanks, Keith. I'll just then give a little bit of a wrap up. Um, so if we've successfully drawn attention to the importance of putting together the agendas of um, climate change and uh, youth employment and job creation, what might be a policy agenda that would um, carry this forward? Um, one can think about it in, in terms of the, the things that one would do um, in, for everyone, um, simply because it's important to prepare the agricultural sector to adapt to climate change and um, for everyone to be ready for that. And you know, the kinds of things that one would do of general relevance would be general education, of course, um, investment in reproductive health, so that those um, uh, countries that are still in the early stages of um, demographic transition, so that the people there have an opportunity to make um, appropriate choices um, according to their changing um, opportunities about family size and um, uh, behavior. Um, investments in rural roads, power, telecommunications, of course, um, important, but a, a key that we've tried to emphasize is the relevance of agricultural science, um, the development of new management techniques that are appropriate for resource constraints and changing natural um, and, uh, conditions under, the, under climate change, and the development and release of new varieties. Um, a great need for improved climate and weather information, um, Certainly important to um, have good measures of land administration so that um, land markets, land uh, relations can uh, function appropriately and um, where land in production has to either increase or decrease um, as, as in response to climate change, both for adaptation and for mitigation. Some land has to move into, into forests or in perennial use um, and to have um, 
policies of land administration that facilitate that adjustment is really important. And then, of course, market intelligence. If the markets are changing, if prices are changing, if the um, geography of production is changing, it's very important to have that information um, available and conveyed to producers, and particularly to make it clear that there are opportunities and high value products um, for people entering the labor force. But then, aside from that agenda that um, addresses the um, needs for everybody, what might be done specifically for young people? Uh, well, of course, there's the general education, which is of, of particular relevance for young people because they're the ones who are investing intensively in schooling. But th there's been a bit of a, a discussion about whether it's important to have um, vocational and technical education or just general education. And I think the um, the impact assessments of various programs are coming out on the side of um, the importance of general education, learning the skills needed to learn to learn so that people have the ability to adapt to a rapidly changing environment where a particular set of skills from vocational education might not be relevant. So um, very important for young people to have investment in reproductive health and to ac have access to reproductive health serv services, to have transparency in land transactions so that as land is changing hands, young people understand that, um, they understand the prices, they have options to either buy or, or rent, um, they're able to be included in the changing uh, land transactions. Um, they'll have a need for mentorship to manage high value crops. Um, in many of those cases, there's, um, uh, you know, tech, they're technically demanding. There's information that people need to have um, and that that can be conveyed either through ICT based extension or through advisory services. But there has to be some mechanism to assist young people taking on um, technically challenging tasks. Um, they are going to demand machine services. They don't want to do the same level of um, manual labor that um, past generations have and machine services are going in. Uh, and then not for the youngest, for the 15 to 24 um, age group, but for the next age up. Um, that's the age where young people would be um, starting up their own farms. And there's probably going to be a need for grant-based cost sharing to help people enter agriculture once they have some more experience uh, working on and with um, uh, modern farming. So that would be in the age group of 25 to 34. So those are some policy measures that might be um, particularly relevant for including young people in an agenda of climate resilient agriculture preparing for the future. But I think I simply want to close with a um, reiteration of the importance of this, of um, paying attention to preparing climate resilience in agriculture in countries where agriculture will be employing large numbers of young people in the future. Um, there has to be preparation for that so that that employment um, is a good opportunity for them and that it's, it's implemented with increasing labor productivity and rising wages because the alternative is um, not a very good one to contemplate. So with that, we can say Great. thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks very much to, to Karen and Keith. And we received a couple questions, but uh, for those of you online, keep typing them in. We welcome all, all of those. I wanted to, I have, I have a couple of questions around the implications and, and the policy agenda that you mentioned, but I wanted to first then start out with uh, some of the um, data that you presented. What struck me in the graphic where you had the percentage of youth population against the number of increased days of extreme heat, for example, that one graphic, you'll notice there was a grouping of of countries in the low, low situation and high, high, and very few off diagonal. And I was wondering if that's, is that just a coincidence or is, it, is there some reason that we, we might expect that kind of pattern to, to hold because of the relationship between those two or some other kinds of factors? Um, have you given any thought to that? That, that kind of really struck me. <laughs> so this I one, think, I think, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had not uh, given thought to that, but it is striking that, uh, yeah, if you look at those countries that uh, are expecting a large increase in the number of extreme heat days, they're basically all over on the right-hand side. And if you look at those countries with high youth population, they're basically all, I mean, the, yeah. the, the Sub-Saharan Africa countries are squarely in that upper right-hand quadrant. There are, I mean, some examples of, uh, countries, uh, let's say in the lower right, IRQ stands for Iraq. There's a country with presumably lots of uh, extreme heat days already. And so it may be that 
you know, as a as a percentage, the increase is not that much. Uh, that would be an example where they're already experiencing lots of heat stress, but presumably historically have some experience in in adapting to that. Whereas some of these other countries, Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, those are in the far upper right, uh, as noted, they have less experience historically with that type of uh, extreme heat, but are, are going to see rapid increase. I, I don't know, Karen, do you have thoughts <laughs> I, on I those don't, diagonals? I, you know, a, a lot of our other things that have very interesting clusters in the scatter plots, uh, we can tell a story of how that's related to the stage of structural transformation. In this one, um, I, I don't think we really can. I think part of it is the temporal versus tropical um, distribution of countries. And um, many of the temporal ones tend to be um, relatively developed. They have fewer young people, aging population. They're going to get more heat, but it won't put them in the extreme days. And so that's, I think, why you see that cluster down in the lower left-hand side. But I, I can't tell much of a story for um, the rest of it. OK. Great, thanks. So one of the key messages is that output uh, growth has to uh, surpass the growth of the agriculture labor force for there to, to be uh, higher wages and, and good returns to agriculture. Um, and you offered a number, talked a little bit about technologies. Are there, um, uh, you know, currently around the world, agriculture growth has picked up recently. Are there um, like some, some specific concerns today, even before we think about climate change, where, where there, there's a lot, where there's you have particular concerns that this is lagging, um, uh, with what, what's required there. And, and in terms of technical change, are there certain ones that are better for jobs or worse for jobs? You mentioned machine use uh, on your last slide, for example. We know machines can also improve productivity, but they can also displace labor in some cases. Um, there's a great uptake in herbicide use in African countries, for example, as well. Um, I don't know if you want to reflect on the, the, the types of technological change and, and whether we're on good trajectories for, for <laughs> I, I think, start? yeah, I'll, I'll just say quickly that I don't know the answer, but I think I know who does know the answer. Um, <laughs> um, I think what you're asking about is the portfolio of technologies, the portfolio of production, and then the portfolio of sort of, um, you know, input use within the um, production of, of, of that output. And I think there's some very interesting modeling work. Um, uh, James Thurlow, um, Rui Ventica, and um, a couple of other colleagues have been um, looking at the, the composition of different agricultural portfolios in terms of um, what they deliver um, in terms of you know, um, GDP growth, agricultural GDP, um, nutrition, uh, and jobs. And so I think it's possible to disaggregate um, an agricultural growth portfolio according to, you know, to, to pull out of that um, concentration in which particular products would create more jobs. In this very, you know, overview, you know, we haven't done that, but I, I think it can be done. Did you? Well, I would just uh, comment on the other part of your question as to current concerns. Looking back at prices, I think there is periodically great attention to investment in agriculture, but it's triggered by these spikes mm. and it goes away fairly rapidly after the after the, the, the spikes subside. And while this graph shows that there is apparently this uh, change that we think is going to continue into the future in terms of a, a longer term increase in prices, if we extended this series back to the beginning of the 1900s, the, the long-term trend is very much one of, of, of decline, again, punctuated by increases. And I think it's really hard to change the mindset of, of that inertia that sort of suggests, well, things have been improving, they will continue, we'll respond to, to crises, but maybe not yet the awareness that there's a fundamental shift that really needs to take place in terms of investment for the longer-term challenge. And are, a question, are you aware of any countries that are maybe bucking that trend that, that stand out as um, um, investing quite uh, consistently in agriculture R&D and, and maybe paying a bit, bit more attention to climate change that you're aware of that they could set examples for other countries? <laughs> I would, I was going to jump to our graph here and see if, if uh, 
some stand out. So on this on this chart here on the right hand side, this shows countries according to the ASTI database that actually uh, some on the far right hand side, so some Sub-Saharan African countries with relatively high uh, youth shares of population, NAM, that's Namibia, BWA, Botswana, ZAF, South Africa. I mean, there are some countries that relative to their neighbors in terms of the spectrum of, of population profile as well as geographically are investing uh, more than others. And if you go to the volume um, on really interesting work on structural transformation that came out, I think in 2016, maybe 2017, it's um, Danny Roderick, uh, it, Maggie McMillan, Danny Roderick, and Claudia Sepulveda uh, looking at case studies of structural transformation. They do pull out um, one example within India. They look at different um, regions within India, and um, they show the, the state of Gujarat um, having made a decision to invest in agriculture, not just agricultural science, but the whole range of infrastructure, um, you know, land administration, um, and, and absorbing increased labor in agriculture with rising productivity. So it's like a kind of mini example of um, what most countries did at the national level in the earlier stage of um, structural transformation, when there was that investment in, in the fundamentals and investment in agriculture, and they absorbed a growing agricultural labor force at the same time that labor productivity was rising. They show an example of that in, um, in Gujarat, and then contrast it to the state of Maharashtra, which um, invested in other things um, and didn't achieve as rapid growth um, and um, hasn't had a rising agricultural labor force. So that means sort of unpeeling the very large um, aggregates of India. But that piece of work did not focus specifically on adaptation to climate change. It was investment in, in an agricultural growth agenda more generally. Great. I had a, a couple of questions came in, particularly in relation to uh, Africa's South of Sahara. So uh, what was made note of is a couple of some stylized facts from there. One is the, the heterogeneity of agroecology. So a lot of your results are presented at national level, but we know within countries, there's a lot of gradients of agroecology. And how does that, you know, affect, you know, uh, the ability to take action? Because there is a lot of nuances to be dealt with. So that's one, one issue. So, somewhat relatedly was the, the notion that, well, infrastructure development is also quite variable in Africa. You have peri-urban areas, which are quite, quite more developed uh, infrastructures, and the, perhaps the job prospects for the youth are different there than remote areas. So then how, if you've given thought to that uh, dimension. And then thirdly, was it was noted that, well, in Africa, we still have a preponderance of small farms. So even though they can be, they can still achieve yields. They, in terms of absolute level of income that can be generated from small plot, from small land holdings, or small and profits, may still yet be a disincentive for, for investing in, in farming. So, I guess if you take any one of those, if you wish, but how did the, how if you had any reactions to how that might uh, affect your your conclusions and implications? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, excellent, excellent points. And as the one of the slides we showed uh, indicated, there's huge diversity in the impacts, and that was, you know, this was just one one uh, way of capturing some of that, depending on uh, what kind of crop and where it's grown, and by large versus small farmers and so forth. I think it comes back to a point you made, Karen, mm -hmm. in that it, well, a couple of things. One is that it's important to invest at or to to uh, think in terms of policy and investment at a local scale not just at the national scale precisely because of that diversity but also to think of uh, uh, in terms of small farms many of them even today they're already integrated into other parts of the economy it might be part it might be the rural non-farm sector and other parts of the the, the food value chain, or it might be connections to uh, urban uh, employment as well. And that planning also needs to consider not just, I think this is, as you were saying, Karen, not just uh, uh, vocational or, or technology specific types of, of planning and investment and preparation, but in terms of uh, developing skills that allow uh, young people to take advantage of opportunities more generally, not just in the agricultural yeah. sector. 
I guess on the issue of um, national perspectives as opposed to local, um, I think that's one of the constraints that we have on the modeling um, capacities now. And I think you know Keith and his crew are working very hard to you know try to get you know down to the pixel level and get much more um, disaggregated. But at the same time, there's enough um, uncertainty within the climate models that you know even if you can model at a very disaggregated level you're still going to have a range of possible outcomes that might be relevant for that very small local area so i think we're not yet at the point where we can go to a you know a farmers organization in one you know county someplace and say this is what's going to happen to you so you better get ready for this um, and i think that's why it's really important to first of all get the information out there and to prepare people to be managing uncertainty, um, you know, processing information as best they can, and you know, give them the assistance to do that. Uh, so, I guess that's what I would. I, I I sympathize with the person who sent in that question because we would all <laughs> like to be able to um, you know have much more certainty about what's going to happen in any particular area because then we could plan and invest for it. And I think we're just not really at that point yet, and we just have to do the best that we can. On the on the question of infrastructure and you know might opportunities be different for people who are located close to towns as opposed to those in in remote areas? Yes, of course that's true. Um, and investment in infrastructure is you know really important for making good opportunities but i think we shouldn't step back from that and say well then primary agriculture will be employing only young people in the remote areas and anybody who's close to a town is going to be out of agriculture i think you know there's a tendency for us to use our models of structural transformation that we carry around in our head and say oh people leave the farm um, but in fact um, Putting the infrastructure in often allows people to have mixed livelihoods so that they stay on the farm part of the time. So we should um, recognize the importance of infrastructure, but not see that as an alternative to employment in primary agriculture. And we shouldn't even think that, well, agricultural employment is going to mean, you know, you're working in a processing plant or something like that. Um, it's primary agriculture farm, you know, working with the dirt is, is still going to be important. And I think right. there's just a lot of resistance to that, you know, that recognition. And then that's why we're pushing that, at least I am pushing that very hard. And on the issue of small farms, of course, um, it's hard to make a living from a small farm. And as young people um, move into areas that are already relatively densely settled, the farms are going to get smaller. The only answer to that is to diversify the livelihoods, find, you know, mixed opportunities to to earn and to move into higher value products i think we're going to see a lot of small farms moving out of you know low low value staples and moving into things that you know give a better opportunity for for income generation actually there was one question i do just a comment about the difference between primary agriculture production and and uh, employment and agriculture at the different places of the value chain. And that a question did come on that data, but whether it was possible also to invest at other levels of the value chain to help stimulate um, agricultural primary production. Yeah, I, I, I can't comment from, from our modeling because right. as, yeah, as yeah. Karen said, we're, we're limited in, in our ability to capture some of those sorts of things. But right. certainly yeah, one would expect but that I, I think case. From the perspective of the PIM program, that's one reason why the program um, has put so much emphasis on on value chains, on competitiveness of agriculture. Um, because if I mean, think about it: if you've got growing demand, which is what happens when you have rising population, you have growing demand for food. You have a market sitting right there. Um, if you have opportunity to you know produce more through primary production. You still have to get that product. You know, you need the logistics, you need the the processing, and if you don't have competitive handling of the food between the farm and the fork, then you're going to lose that market to imports. And in part, that's what's happening now. And so, investment in all of those stages of the value chain that go from the farm to the final consumer is incredibly important for creating a market for climate resilient agriculture if you're willing to invest in the primary production. Two um, specific uh, comments or, or 
questions came in uh, in regards to possible uh, investments for young people. One one had noted, um, you know, the importance of, uh, of uh, enabling them to have access more to finance, credit, and so forth. And I think they just wanted a reflection about what you thought about programs that could do that as part of a recommendation package. And the other thing was about cooperatives. So if you have, you know, limited uh, capital of their own, maybe co combining again to work in cooperatives. So those were two specific suggestions that they from uh, our listeners that they wanted to hear comments on. <laughs> well, um, you know, as we think about uh, traditionally, as we have thought about opportunities for youth employment in agriculture, we've said there are sort of three big buckets in which um, opportunities have to be improved in order for people successfully, young people successfully to enter agriculture. And one of those buckets is access to finance, another is access to land, and the third is, you know, the the skills to you know, operate successfully. Um, we didn't kind of put a lot of attention on each of those um, issues in, in this one hour session because we wanted to really focus on the, the linkage with climate change. And I do think that the linkage with climate change brings us much more to the you know, investment in agricultural science and technology and kind of making sure that, that the underpinning of um, adaptive technologies and management techniques is there so that young people can then get access to it. And so that sort of links more with the skills agenda and, and um, uh, extension. But that's not to say that finance isn't important. It's very important. Um, and from what we've observed, I think a lot of, um, a lot of programs that make, that in, in increase um, financial inclusion um, for agriculture, which are helpful for young people, um, have to have an element of grant based um, to them because you know if you make it you know, you're purely credit, um, often the, there will be difficulties repaying that. So you know it, it's often the case that um, a, a starting out um, financial intervention targeted for young people or for people, young adults in that range from um, 25 to 34 who are starting farms, it's usually appropriate to have a grant uh, component to that, uh, but not 100% grant. And um, so your, your, your presentation, I think you were pitched at the national level and limited by data, but we didn't hear much about gender, but there was a question about that in terms of a, an agenda for young people um, whether there would be some gender dimensions uh, and nuances that we should also be concerned with in terms of your recommendations. Well, I think that the, um, the opportunities for young women are going to be um, different from the opportunities for young men. Um, I think young women and young men um, need basically the same things. Um, they need education, they need access to reproductive health services, um, they need um, access to the resources that allow them to, to enter farming. Now to the extent that those um, opportunities are not available, then the absence falls differentially on you know, young men and young women. And certainly the, you know, the absence of reproductive health services is going to fall differentially on young women. Um, there's no question about it. And um, but I think that the, the underlying argument that the investments in agriculture have to be such that agriculture is competitive, is resilient, is able to adapt to climate change, I think those um, arguments are of equal importance for young men and young women. Um, so, you know, in, in the general climate resilience uh, statement, I wouldn't say that you know, there's an awful lot of sort of gender differentiation, but in terms of the the investments in the policy um, actions, some are more important for young women. <laughs> but I would say, actually, that in terms of um, equipping African agricultural science to address climate change, investment, you know, attracting young women into African agricultural science is very important because young women are underrepresented there now. So we shouldn't just think of the primary uh, farm employment in that respect. We should think of representation of women you know, throughout you know, all of the 
um, elements of, of a functioning agricultural system, including the science uh, you mentioned. Oh, very good. Well, um, we're just uh, at the top of our hour, and, there, and I think I have managed to get uh, all the questions. Maybe I missed one or two, <laughs> but, uh, but thank you very much for everyone online. I didn't know if you wanted to uh, make any closing uh, remarks um, or maybe inform us about what, where your, your, your study is coming out in for people to look forward to, perhaps. Closing remarks? Yeah. Uh, I would just simply say, as evidenced by the questions, there's lots more work to be done, and we have a lot going on. We do this in partnership with uh, collaborators in the other CGIR centers, as well as universities and other centers around the world. And so we have a, we still have a full agenda, and particularly things like uh, youth and gender, which have not traditionally been things that we focused on. Clearly, there's a need for for more work on that, and this work will be. Uh, it contributed to the EFAD's Rural Development Report, which I gather will be coming out soon. Very soon. Yeah. And there's also going, uh, there's a special issue of um, journal development studies um, under review now. And so, you know, it, it probably will come out in that as well. I think, um, you know, I've already sort of said how strongly I feel about the importance of recognizing um, where the, um, the agricultural climate adaptation agenda is really important for youth youth employment. A lot of that is, is um, in the African context. So I won't repeat that, but I will simply say that I've been surprised at how, <clears throat> how much discussion we've had, even within the agricultural economics profession, on this question of, is agriculture an important employer for young people in the future, or should we be thinking about the fact that everybody's going to leave agriculture, and if it's agriculture, then it's going to be processing. It's not primary agriculture. I've had a lot of back and forth um, with my colleagues in the agricultural economics profession, you know, very esteemed, highly respected colleagues who do wonderful work. And I think that's because we're, we're far enough along in, in our thinking as a profession about structural transformation that we kind of, we've forgotten the early stages. We've forgotten the experience that countries went through um, in the, that earlier period. And so the idea that the agricultural labor force grows in the beginning before, absolutely, before it turns around, is something that people do a bit of a double take on that. They think, oh, no, if agriculture is a declining sector as a share, then it must be the labor force must be declining as well. And so I've been pushing very hard on recognizing that that's not going to be the case in Africa for the next 15 to 20 years. Um, there may be individual countries where you see the turnaround earlier than others, and Ghana may be one of them. But I think in general, we're still looking at a growth of the agricultural labor force, and it means that there has to be um, a, an agriculture that's able to absorb labor um, without pulling the whole thing down. Great. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed it, and I hope everyone else did. I, I really, really value the fact that you challenged some myths there. I think that was eye-opening to many of us. And uh, to bring together these two different areas of, of work, climate uh, resilience on the one hand, and, and what to do about uh, jobs for the youth, bringing it together and sheds light and, and makes us re-examine re the policies that we've been individually advocating in both of those areas, and really do they make sense. And I think that's often a very uh, useful practice, and I think it's a good lesson for PIM. We have a lot of diverse flagships, and i looking at many different issues, and I think bringing those together, I think, always puts a new lens and, on things, and it can help sharpen our messages uh, for policymakers and other decision makers. So once again, thank you. and. Uh, for all of you online, stay tuned. We'll have uh, upcoming webinars in the future and we will advertise them again shortly. Thank you.